From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Dallas Peterson will talk about applying herbicides here in the fall in advance of next year's row crop production for control of winter annual weeds. He'll go over the preferred herbicide options for this purpose. Then from the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McGowan will go over a recent court decision in western Kansas over the legality of the local enhanced management area approach to irrigation water conservation on the part of groundwater management districts. Also, Kansas FFA state reporter J.W. Wells reports from the first day of the National FFA Convention. And K-State's Gus Vanderhoven awaits with Stop, Look, and Listen. All that here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. You row crop producers, as you round out your fall harvest, well, it's not too early to think about weed control for the 2020 production. Fall applied herbicides can pay off if used strategically. We'll cover the alternatives there now with our guest, Research and Extension Weed Management Specialist here at K-State, Dallas Peterson. Dallas, we have talked of this option before, and as the years have gone along, this has found favor with a lot of producers, and justifiably so, you say. Well, absolutely. You know, before we went to no-till, it was, we never consider that really because we were controlling those winter annual weeds in the fall and even you know the early uh, germinating weeds in the spring uh, with tillage and so the winter annuals for the most part weren't an issue in our summer row crops uh, before we went to no-till but then as we shifted uh, we still had a little bit of that same mindset that we didn't need to maybe do anything until the spring but with the winter annuals in many cases that's too late and so by going out with a fall herbicide treatment uh, it can make life so much easier in the spring uh, if you get those controlled and yeah maybe you still have a few coming up in the spring but it's so much easier to deal with uh, than if they've overwintered and as we're discussing fall applications that is meaning the latter part of october well into november yeah that's a good point uh, in fact uh, i sometimes try to emphasize uh, really for me the ideal time for a quote fall treatment is mid-november and uh, even though we are approaching winter at that point in time that's because if you put it on too early in many cases some of the winter annual weeds have not come up yet and you go out there too early, and especially if you're using a residual, it will it will start to break down. So by going on a little bit later, uh, you have more chance for most of those winter annuals to be emerged so you can actually get coverage on them, and your residual herbicides are going to persist longer into the spring. Well, this will likely depend on the crop, but what are the primary weed species that one wants to go after? Corn, grain, sorghum, soybean, ground. Well, probably the big one uh, through the years has been the mare's tail or horseweed. Uh, again, that was not a problem 30 years ago when we were tilling all of our ground, but it has become a major problem uh, in our no-till production, especially in the eastern half of the state, but really statewide as well. Uh, mare's tail is kind of an interesting weed in that we kind of consider it a winter annual, but it can come up in the spring and even in the summer sometimes. But again, if you can control those that came up in the fall, uh, then those that come up later are not nearly as big of an issue. But besides mare's tail, really it's all the winter annual weeds. Uh, henbit, uh, we all like that purple color around here at K-State, but uh, when your fields turn purple in the spring, it uh, maybe isn't your most desirable color. So that's another one uh, that uh, is much better controlled with a fall treatment than if you wait until spring because really by the time it gets going in spring it's already blooming and it becomes much more difficult to manage it dies slowly can create planting problems and so again that's one that's easier handled in the fall mustards 
you know, if you got any winter annual grasses like downy brome or cheat, all of those uh, are quite susceptible in the fall, and the majority of them come up in the fall. So, again, we can just kind of get them out of the way so that we don't have to deal with them uh, in the spring. Well, then, to herbicide choices. And if one is treating ground to be back to corn or grain sorghum next spring, there is a, a lead alternative. Well, yeah, if you know you're going to corn or sorghum, it's hard to go wrong with some atrazine. And uh, in Kansas, at least, we have that option of using fall applied atrazine, which is not the case in some other states. And again, it's a very cost-effective treatment. You're probably not going to use just atrazine by itself, but atrazine in combination with glyphosate, uh, 2,4-D dicamba, that's pretty well going to clean up everything that you have out there uh, and keep it fairly clean up until planting time, especially if you're planting corn. Uh, You might still have some weeds coming on uh, if you're not going to plant corn and you're waiting for sorghum. But again, uh, that really can uh, go a long way and make planting in the spring much more easy. I mentioned the glyphosate 2,4-D dicamba. You know, that's a general treatment that can go on almost any crop, okay, that you're going to plant uh, in the future because limited residual, of course, none with glyphosate, but you do get a little bit of residual, especially out of the dicamba. But by using those three in combination, you pretty well cover, you know, the spectrum of weeds that we have to deal with. Uh, So, again, it's going to provide excellent control of most anything that's up at that point in time. Not going to give you a lot of residual control, okay? But still, it is amazing sometimes if you put that treatment out in the fall how clean things are uh, in the spring. So most of those winter annuals are up and growing in the fall, especially in the eastern part of the state. Uh, talk about soybeans, of course, that's a different ball game, and you have to, to be careful. You can't, of course, use atrazine in that scenario. Uh, but, you know, there are some residual products out there that you could use, uh, things that include uh, the Valor component or the Authority component, and there are a lot of premixes uh, that do include those components. Uh, classic uh, component is another one that can give us some good residual control of those weeds kind of almost up through planting. So uh, again, not so important which one you choose. It's actually going out and and doing something at the right time, you know, to to manage those weeds. Do want to highlight one specific weed, though, because it has been such a challenge and frankly, such a headache for producers, especially in the western reaches of Kansas, and that is kochia. Yeah, and it's not a winter annual, okay? But it's a summer annual that can start to come up in February, which is just amazing, okay, that it can come up that early. And the problem being, if it does come up in February, uh, late February, let's say, or even into March, okay, uh, and you don't do something about it until it's uh, up and going, sometimes it's really difficult to manage because some of these fields have such a, a carpet of kochia out there that aside from being tough to kill with a herbicide, it's tough to get good coverage. So that's uh, the one summer annual weed where I think, you know, a late fall or I'll call it winter treatment that can be very, very beneficial. Uh, and actually, if your primary target weed is kochia, I prefer you not do it, you know, in November. I think you're better off to wait until maybe December to make those applications or, again, maybe in February. All depends on the weather, of course. You know, this last year we had a hard time getting out there because it was wet all the time. But, again, late fall, late winter or at the very latest, very early spring, and I'm going to call that early March uh, with those treatments because, again, it will start to come up at that point in time. We get our best kochia control with the residual pre-emergence type of herbicides. And so, again, atrazine would fall into that category. Dicamba also at, the, at higher use rates will give us some pretty good uh, residual, uh, and I'd probably all, always include dicamba with any of those treatments if you're targeting kochia. And uh, there are some others in soybeans. Again, sulfentrazone would probably the something that has sulfentrazone in it or the authority Spartan component in it is probably going to give you your best residual kochia control uh, with those uh, late winter uh, type of treatments. So, again, there are a number of things to contemplate here as far as product selection. We always direct folks to the Chemical Weed Control Guide for Field Crops book from K-State, which covers the alternatives and which 
which will work the best in your cropping scenarios. But this is, for so many reasons, uh, an approach to take, Dallas, and you hinted at this earlier, and it's worth emphasizing. In that, in the fall, our winds tend to be a little bit more tranquil most days. Anyway, the window of opportunity to apply without drift concerns is magnified. Yeah, wind is one component, and the other is there just aren't as many susceptible things, you know, actively growing at that time of the year. You know, again, it used to be we'd finish up with harvest, we, you know, put things away, and we were done for the year. But uh, weed management has become a year-round process. And uh, again, as we've gone to no-till and we've developed herbicide resistance, uh, we've got to keep that in mind and, you know, kind of uh, battle those weeds throughout the year whenever is the most opportune time to get ahead of them. All right. Well, before you go, we must acknowledge as well, this will be the final time we visit on agriculture today. For those who don't know, Dallas is retiring from K-State Research and Extension and the Department of Agronomy after, what, a quarter century? As a uh, 30 specialist? years. A little more than that. 30 years this fall. It's been a, a good run and a rewarding one for you, you say. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I, I've enjoyed our visits, and I appreciate Likewise. your ability sometimes to... Uh, Make me sound halfway intelligent, because sometimes that can be difficult. <laughs> not true, not true at all, but we know you're going to enjoy a well-deserved retirement, and, and your commitment and contributions to crop production in Kansas with the knowledge base on weed control has been uh, remarkable. We've appreciated working with you for these many years, Dallas. Well, thank you very much. And we wish you all the best in that forthcoming retirement. Weed Management Specialist Dallas Peterson, K-State Research and Extension along with us. In addition to the Chemical Weed Control Guide, you can check out an article on this very topic that was posted recently in the Agronomy e-update newsletter out of K-State. It was dated October the 18th, just a couple of Fridays back, on controlling annual weeds with fall-applied herbicides ahead of, in this case, corn and sorghum production at agronomy.ksu.edu. This is Agriculture Today. We'll break away now for a few moments and then return with more on this, the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Welcome back. You are listening to Agriculture Today. And in our latest visit with a professor of agricultural law and taxation out of the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McCohen, we'll take up a topic which will probably be at the forefront of litigation for some time, broadly speaking now, and that is the protection of water rights. We're going to hone in on a Kansas-based case as we talk about this. Roger, before we go any further, though, we probably ought to outline the basic framework of water rights as they would apply here in the state of Kansas? Well, Eric, in the state of Kansas, uh, we're governed by what's known as the prior appropriation system, and that's based on a recognition that water is relatively scarce, and the system establishes rights to water based on when water is first put to a beneficial use. And in fact, most of the U.S. west of the 100th meridian, uh, which is that longitude line that connects the north and south poles that runs through basically uh, Cozad, Nebraska, Dodge City, Kansas, as it comes down through Kansas, and it also forms the eastern border of the Texas panhandle with Oklahoma. So once you get west of that line, uh, just about everywhere west of there, you're under the prior appropriation system and, and even places uh, east. So since it bisects Kansas, Kansas is under the prior appropriation system for how we determine uh, water rights and how water is to be allocated. And, and like I said, it's a first-in-time, first-in-right system. So whoever's going to put that water to a beneficial use first uh, has priority in time of shortage. 
And how this applies to the different water sources, groundwater versus surface water, you might distinguish that. Yeah, that, that's a big issue, particularly in western Kansas, uh, because western Kansas uh, has a layering of water regulation by the state government. Uh, the, and this, this occurs particularly over those areas that are above the Ogallala Aquifer. And so you've got the, not only the prior appropriation system, but you'll have groundwater management districts, and then you'll have something else that the legislature created a number of years ago that is under a groundwater management district, and that's a local enhanced management area, or a LEMA. So there's this layering of regulation as you get further west in Kansas in those areas that lie above the Ogallala Aquifer. And the concern here is, of course, the drawdown on the aquifer and allocating rights to water based on a heightened um, sensitivity to shortages and the drawdown of that aquifer. And now we're nibbling at the details of this case that we'll talk about today. And the question that you're bringing up here, how far can state regulations go when it comes to water rights and water management? And this was uh, taken on in a recent case in western Kansas, testing out the premise of these so-called lemas, which were established some years back. Yeah, that's right. This came up in Gove County. And uh, really the question is, uh, how far beyond just simply administering a permit system that recognizes when a beneficial use was first established for water and uh, protecting those rights, how far can a government go beyond doing those two things? And the question that you run into here, of course, is at some point in time, someone is likely to allege that some sort of governmental regulatory taking has occurred if the regulatory impact is severe enough. Because there, there are a lot of ranchers uh, and irrigators in the western part of Kansas that have what are known as vested water rights. They have a permit in their hand that has a file stamped date on it by the water office in Kansas that says this is when your appropriative right began, and that's how we determine seniority. Well, if I've got a vested right to pump water in accordance with the limits in my permit, can the state go any further to add restrictions to that? Uh, and that's the question that really has come up in this case. Because the Lima Local Enhanced Management Area does in fact call for stricter usage and regulations on water pumped, in this case out of a groundwater management district. So how, how did the plaintiffs approach this as they are clearly opposed to the Lima concept? Well, they, uh, it was, the plaintiffs are irrigators in this case, as well as voting members of the groundwater management district out there. And they sued to stop the implementation of the district-wide LEMA on the basis that it violated their vested water rights, was arbitrary and capricious, and was unconstitutional. Well, the local trial court, and that's where we're at in this litigation, where this is the first step. Uh, the, so the county district court out there disagreed, upheld the district-wide LEMA, and rejected all of the claims of these plaintiffs. And, of course, they were claiming that the water conservation restrictions contained in the proposal basically were what we call a collateral attack on their perfected water rights. In other words, the government was doing, the state government of Kansas was doing an end run kind of through the back door to take away some of their rights that they have in accordance with their permits that they have in their hands that were perfected. And they said the state can't do that. Well, the court disagreed, concluding that groundwater permits didn't guarantee any set amount of water and noted that the district-wide LEMA was not a permanent reduction in water appropriation, but that it did contemplate the, the state coming in and revisiting the matter in the future. So the court said as long as the LEMA was in place and the reduction in pumping was within state law limits, then the chief engineer division of water resources in Kansas, uh, that's the regulatory head uh, in the state of Kansas, did have the discretion to approve the district-wide LEMA. And in fact, if you look at the other complaints by the plaintiffs, they were challenging the basic implementation of the Lima, that it didn't follow protocol, so to say. Well, the court disagreed on those points, too. Uh, they did. They said, the court said that the Lima was uh, reviewable by the state ag secretary, was subject to judicial review. They went through a public process uh, where they got input from people. And uh, they, they said that the, uh, the groundwater management district uh, board was a 
elected in a democratic process. So the court didn't uh, have any problem in concluding that it was not an arbitrary and capricious decision by a governmental body or a series of governmental bodies. They said they followed the correct process. Then on the constitutional claim, of course, what the irrigators and others were claiming was an equal protection violation. And the court said, well, yes, the Lima did sort irrigators into different classes, but it didn't violate equal protection because that sorting was rationally related to the Lima's purpose of conserving water resources. You know, that's a pretty low threshold to overcome as long as the state can show that there is some legitimate state interest here. Conservation of water resources is a legitimate state interest. Then there's probably not going to be an equal protection violation. And that's indeed what the trial court said. So you look at this, and the trial court basically found for the uh, state, in this case, the chief water engineer, on just about all counts. But you think this is ripe for appeal, Roger? Oh, this is definitely, this is big enough. It's not going to sit with some county-level district court judge, uh, judge's opinion. This is going to go up the food chain. It's going to go to the Court of Appeals. Uh, It's probably going to go to the Kansas Supreme Court. And this is something, again, that the legislature may be interested in. Of course, there's additional litigation that's come out of the Garden City area, the warrior litigation down there. And um, there's probably going to be some additional litigation that's in the pipeline that's going to end up in the court system from western Kansas soon also. So this is a big issue, whether Kansas sticks with a strict prior appropriation doctrine, whether more layering of regulation is coming, that is yet to be seen. But this uh, this case certainly highlights the issue of how far a state can go. And that's that's going to be fleshed out uh, as this case unwinds and we get more cases. And you make your point in your article on this that this could potentially dovetail into another decision that was made recently on how far a party can take these types of challenges up the court ladder. The opportunity is there to push this as far as the federal court based on this most recent other ruling. Yeah, and that other ruling is a United States Supreme Court opinion uh, late last term in June of uh, this year. And what the Supreme Court said was that there's no need to exhaust all of your uh, administrative and judicial remedies at the state level if you think the state has taken a, a property interest from you that requires compensation. You can jump straight into federal court. And I think the state of Kansas needs to keep that in mind. Uh, as we go through this litigation, I'm sure that the irrigators and the plaintiffs in this case are cert- and their attorneys are certainly aware of that. Uh, that you don't have to endure state court litigation on the taking issue before you seek compensation in the federal court system. So if the claim is that the government has engaged in a taking, that's going to be decided by the federal courts, and the state may have to pay up for that, even though the plaintiffs don't have to go through the state process. Well, this may be, as you say, just the beginning of litigation regarding uh, water rights in Kansas on this level. And Roger has, of course, captured all that was decided in this recent court case out of Gove County in his blog, which can be found at washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. It's entitled Regulating Existing Water Rights, How Far Can State Government Go? And we always appreciate the word, Roger. Thanks for sharing some thoughts on this with us right here. Thank you, Eric. He's Roger McCohen, a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, along with us every other week here on Agriculture Today. Now this break, when we come back, the first in this week's reports from the 2019 National FFA Convention in Indianapolis and what Kansas FFA members are in line to achieve there. That's next here on the K-State Radio Network. today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org.
Welcome back. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. As promised, we've reports for you from the 92nd National FFA Convention, which just got going yesterday in Indianapolis and attending, among many other Kansans, the state FFA reporter this year, J.W. Wells. J.W. is from the Sedan chapter in southeast Kansas originally. And so the convention is underway, J.W. It's an exciting time for all who are attending, isn't it? Yes, it is. A favorite part of National FFA Convention for me is simply being able to go anywhere and just see the blue corduroy jackets. My father's an ag teacher, and National FFA Convention has always been near and dear to my heart. Well, let's talk for a moment about this day's activities. This is more or less the first formal day of the convention. A great deal of preliminary things took place yesterday. But what's ahead today? There are several different things available for FFA members to be involved in. Just like last year, the Blue Room is back and better than ever. There's also some things that your Kansas FFA state officers, as well as other state officers, are involved in today as uh, continuing delegate business. We are continuing some things that delegates from Kansas FFA Convention voted on this past May, and we are bringing those votes, representing those votes, here um, in Indianapolis. Also, later tonight at 6.30, we have the rodeo, and at 8.30, we have the Old Dominion concert. And the very first session, the opening session, 1A, is at 3.30 today. The Blue Room, for those not familiar with that, you might explain what that's about. Yes, of course. The Blue Room is a partnership with the National FA Organization and Microsoft. Essentially, this is a giant mega room focusing on the uh, advancements in precision agriculture and technology in agriculture. Essentially, it is bringing up the mission of 2050, of how American agriculturalists are going to have to feed a very robust and expanding population. The Blue Room offers insights into what technologies are today and what future technologies may be able to help feed that population mark at 2050. That uh, activity, that room just buzzes with energy, as we've been told. So that'll be a, a great experience for those taking it in. And you mentioned as well, of course, this is a national convention. There will be items and issues on the floor for debate and for voting. What are some of the primary issues that uh, the Kansas delegation is taking to the floor? So far in our delegate business that we went through yesterday, there are several different committee reports that we will approve the very first part of the day. My committee was about urban agriculture and how the National FSA organization can better promote and sustain urban FSA chapters. I know some other members of the team were on a rezoning committee for the National FSA regions. There was also talk about integrating traditional production agriculture more into just traditional FFA events. And there was also a committee regarding other various FFA things, such as state needs, about how national FFA can do a better job of addressing what each individual state needs and basically reaching the point that the FFA members are having a more positive experience than they already are. So it'll be a busy time on the convention floor, the delegates mulling those things over. And we do want to mention this time, and we'll follow up next couple of days on other items from the convention, but uh, Kansan is in the running for national office and has cleared the first hurdle toward that goal. Yes, he has. I am very proud of Garrett Craig. Uh, For those unaware, Garrett served as the state sentinel for Kansas this past year. He has been preparing so much over the summer and into this first part of the school year for national office. And just a couple days ago, Garrett made it past the first, like you said, the first hurdle. And he is now, I believe the term is now a finalist candidate for national office. My team went out to dinner with him a couple nights ago. He is super wound. He is very excited for where this goes. But overall, we are so very proud of Garrett. And just making it to this point is an achievement. The process can be fairly grinding, can't it, J.W.? (laughs) Yes, it can. This year, there were a total of 44 national officer candidates, 
And to the last that I heard from the first election that Garrett made in, the national officer candidates were whittled down from 44 to about 20. So this was a very strenuous and very, very insightful process. Well, we obviously wish Garrett all the best as he continues his quest for a national FFA officer spot. Garrett Craig from the Clay Center FFA, by the way. And we'll be hoping to visit with you tomorrow, roughly this same time, J.W., for there's a lot more to talk about as things unfold at the convention. Thank you very much. We appreciate it, and we will touch base tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you so much. I look forward to talking with you tomorrow. Very well. He is the state FFA reporter for Kansas, J.W. Wells, checking in with us from the 2019 National FFA Convention, ongoing now in Indianapolis. Rounding out this segment then, surveys show a great degree of confusion among consumers about marketing and labeling terms used for imitation meat products. Todd Domer reports here, a bill introduced by one member of the Kansas congressional delegation would address that issue. Kansas Congressman Roger Marshall and New York Congressman Anthony Brindisi have introduced bipartisan federal legislation called the Real Meat Act of 2019. The bill sets out to protect consumers from deceptive marketing practices related to alternative protein or fake meat products. Language in the proposed legislation would establish a federal definition of beef that applies to food labels, It would reinforce existing misbranding provisions to eliminate consumer confusion. The Food and Drug Administration has failed to initiate meaningful enforcement action against a host of misbranded products for decades. The Real Meat Act will require fake products to prominently display the term imitation in the product name. Currently, FDA does not pre-approve food product labels, leaving any potential enforcement to take place after a product already has entered the market and the damage has been done. Marshall's bill would address this issue by requiring FDA to notify USDA immediately when an imitation meat product is misbranded or the labeling is misleading to consumers. Should FDA fail to initiate enforcement proceedings, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture is granted authority to seek enforcement action. I'm Todd Domer. You're listening to Agriculture Today. We'll stand aside one more time now, and then when we return, our weekly get-together with K-State's Gus Vanderhoven. This is the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop Look and listen. Most of Kansas is rural. We are an agricultural state. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. A few weeks ago, I listened to a talk given by the author of the book Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth. The author, Sarah Schmarsch, reflected on her growing up in rural Kansas. The talk was about socioeconomics of rural life. I'd read the book. It left me thinking. I'm glad I heard her lecture. But I'm really glad that I read the article in the Manhattan Mercury written by Rafael Garcia about the lecture or talk. It pulled it all together. I'm going to read the book again, and I know, knowing what I know now, the book will help me acknowledge what I have sensed and seen in and across rural Kansas. 
Of course, most of Kansas is rural. We are an agricultural state. Yes, we have industry near our big cities and some rural enterprises. But Kansas is land, beautiful land. When Sarah Smart says she dislikes the expression fly over country, I know how she feels. But she's a fifth generation Kansan. I am a first generation. She was born in Kansas. I came by choice, and we made home here. Sarah Smart chose to come back to live in Kansas after her studies at Columbia University, New York. She studied there under the McNair Scholars Program, a program that helps first-generation, underrepresented, and low-income students. When she saw the flyer, she said, that's me, and got accepted. I think the word navigate is meaningful here. For those who are first-generation students, the whole experience of going to college to attend and stick to the university experience can be and is daunting. But once they set their goal and work hard to overcome the odds, they have opened doors to another world of opportunities. I know. But if in that process they do not forget their roots, they can be very rich, not necessarily financially, but surely in life experiences. A student friend of mine with farm background sent me an article which I will quote. The first time I met her and her family was at a farm bureau dinner meeting. I was there to give a talk. Kansas landscape. She asked me, what can you tell me about landscape architecture? Over the summer and later, we have stayed in contact. I've shared and shown her what landscape architecture is about. She has searched and is now pursuing computer science. But having roots, strong roots to the land, she understands the article she sends with thoughts by Yedidja Jenkins. And I quote, Whether it was tumultuous or idyllic, endlessly transient or stationary, we form some feeling of home, even if you hated where you grew up. You hated it with the energy of knowing there are places you could have loved. There's a longing for a sense of being from somewhere, a land, a culture, a family. This is, of course, a desire to belong, not just to a group, but to the world. We want to feel like we inevitably sprung up from the soil. And disconnect from this feeling turns us cold and mean, sad or twisted, into conquerors or wanderers or consumers, into orphans. If we feel uncoupled to the world, we become destroyers of the world. I know ancient Humans didn't own land. That idea didn't become mainstream until agriculture society. But he didn't have to. He was the land. There was no such thing as nature and man-made. It was all one thing. This is why so many traditional cultures worshipped mountains and rivers, gave them sacred status. They felt that those things created them. They were family, the most integrated belongings that exists. So far the quote. Coming back to Sarah Smart, who wrote the book Heartland, she was able to hold on to and value her roots as she explained and received a solid education. I love it when Sarah Smart said that she realized that her parents were also capable, smart people. Rather, their place in society kept them from being able to make choices about their careers and futures. She said, I figured out that my mom was brilliant and my dad was a natural poet. And she added, not all farmers do 
what they do by choice. Here I was, she said, surrounded by all of the people who have all of these gifts and talents that are overlooked because they have no choice as to what sort of job they would hold. It's the way our economics work. It is true that today people hold expensive weddings in barns and pay to be able to drink from mason jars. It's agritourism. Some of us can provide the people who look for it a taste of rural living. But it's only a taste and a false taste. Agritourism does not feed the world. It can show how food is grown and what it takes to care for and love the land. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. As always, thanks for being along with us. Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.